Welcome to the original Yu-Gi-Oh! Bandai card game where the rules are made up and the points don't matter. Hey everyone, welcome to Dual Sauce, where I talk about the history of a children's card game. In this episode, we're turning back the pendulum to the most ancient of Yu-Gi-Oh's past. A time before the Fusion deck, a time before the Silver Fang meta, a time before Konami. This is Bandai Yu-Gi-Oh and, oh boy, what a game this is. The rights to Yu-Gi-Oh! was obtained by Konami in 1999, creating the very first format in the OCG. But one year prior, in 1998, the company Bandai got their license from Toei Animation first, since they created the original anime, dubbed Season Zero. To coincide with the release of said Yu-Gi-Oh! anime, Bandai released their first set of cards alongside Toei, and eventually released their third set and a promotional set alongside the last episode later in 1998, to wrap up the Bandai game card pool. So in total, there are three main sets, two promotional sets, all culminating roughly 120 cards in total. I was initially going to jump into the rules of the game, but the obvious thing is the card art, and I can't get around it without tackling that first. The art was taken directly from the manga, and of course, without an anime at the time, the coloring and some art had its own creative liberties, like Giant Soldier Stone and Mystical Elf. Some cards just look straight up weird, like Summon Skull, Time Wizard, and Battle Ox looks like he has smelled something awful. It's interesting to see these familiar cards in a new perspective, like Hitatsumi Giant or Judge Man. There are even a few exclusive cards like Aphrodite and Gorgon. There are your standard monsters, spells, equips, and traps. Then you have character cards, like their characters from the series, like Yugi and Kaiba, that have their own unique effects, and we'll get to those soon. While some cards may look familiar, like Blue Eyes White Dragon and Attack and Defense and Levels, the rules are anything but, being the big difference between the Bandai and Konami games. Unlike the Konami version where you have Battle Steps and Pendulum Summoning and the Jinzo number 7, a little bit of Jinzo in my life, the Yu-Gi-Oh! Bandai OCG game only has 13 rather vaguely laid out rules. Yep, that's it. Only 13 and Everything else you have to decide for yourself, which makes the game as confusing as the Duel Monsters anime at times. Rule number one, both players must use the same number of cards in their decks. This rule makes sense in regards to it's like a traditional card game where the game goes as long as how many cards are in the decks, you know, 52 card decks type of thing. The problem is, is that if you were to go to a tournament, each round someone would potentially have to drastically change their deck because there is no default deck limit. Now, for how the game plays out, you would want an optimal deck size somewhere between 20 to 40 cards, but each player could have different strategies and be forced to change, and who would have to adjust their deck? And what if one person gets to keep their 10 card deck, and half of it is Exodia? It's a messy system, and we're only on the first rule. Rule number two, draw five cards from your deck to form your hand. Simple enough. Rule number three, Select one monster card from your hand and play it to start a battle. This seems, like, normal, however, this causes confusion. Can you only attack with a monster from your hand that turn? And what about if you had a monster on the field and none in your hand? Rules state that after a battle ends, you draw and end your turn so you can only attack once per turn. But if the monster is already in play, then it can attack because these are rules, not phases, right? But the Taya card contradicts this by calling out used cards. See how it gets confusing? Rule number four, to determine the result of the battle, compare the attack of your attacking monster with the defense of the attacked monster. So this is different since you don't calculate attack to attack, but attack to defense. Meaning that high defense cards can give you advantage despite there only being one battle position. Rule number five, if your monster's attack is higher, your opponent's monster is destroyed. Again, this is another simple rule. Rule number six, even if you destroy the opponent's monster, if the defense of your monster is lower than the attack of your opponent's monster, your monster is also destroyed. This just means that both monsters in the battle are attacking equally, which means again, defense does still matter in this game. 
Rule number seven. When the battle ends, draw one card from your deck and you can end your turn. So instead of drawing at the start of the turn, you draw after you attack and like speed duels, there's no main phase two, so the turn will end after battling. Rule number eight. Each turn will continue like this until both players' decks are empty. Yeah, no life points in this game, as the game revolves around winning via the following rule. Rule number nine. Each player counts the total level stars of all monsters that they destroyed. The player with the highest amount is declared the winner. So the way you want to win is to destroy as much of your opponent's monsters as possible, while keeping your own alive, or more so balanced between high and low levels, to destroy monsters and still keep your star count down. It's an interesting system, but that means if you play with a high deck count, yeah, that's a lot of counting for you and your opponent to do. Hence why smaller decks like 20 to 30 cards seem the best way to play. Rule number 10. If you have spell, trap, or equip cards in your hand, you can put them in play face down. Yes, equip cards are considered different. Although all the cards have the same color, their lack of attack and defense make them clear enough aside from Gate Guardian who acts like a spell but has an attribute like a monster yet he has no stats. I'm going with he's a spell. But yeah, you can set spells or traps to use them for later. Rule number 11, you can activate your face down spell, trap, or equip cards at any time during a battle, aka everything is a quick play. Rule number 12, when the effect of a spell, trap, or equip card is used, it is discarded. I assume this means everything has a one time use and goes to the graveyard, or perhaps equip cards are still active on the monster, but I'm a bit unsure. And now the last rule, rule number 13. When a player's deck is empty, the duel will continue until the other player's deck is empty as well. This seems like a weird rule because if the opponent has nothing left, then the duel is basically stopped if they can't do anything, but it's at least a rule in case your opponent has some cards remaining. So as you can tell, the rules are kind of convoluted with generalized rulings and questioning phases among other weird faucets that just cause confusion. I have been diving in this deep pool of rulings for a while now and seem that the best way to figure out the game is by looking at specific cards and their interactions with other cards or rules because there are no sources to try and reference and or expand upon the limited knowledge we have. Rulings are sprinkled on cards which just seems confusing for someone looking in and seeing a card that states how the game ends or to draw 5 cards. Some cards include a special rule which is more or less an effect. We can look at this to figure out ruling questions for the game. It's one big spider web of cards explaining how others work. Like Elegant Egotist, which says, a specific monster made to duplicate. What does that mean? Which monsters does this apply to? What does duplicating do? For those aware of the game, you would know that this applies to Harpy Lady, but that still doesn't explain anything. You have to reference Harpy Ladies 2 and 3, where they state if they're played simultaneously, they become an equip card for Harpy Lady 1. So the way this interaction seems to work is that you summon one of the ladies and essentially chain Egotists to unionize Ladies 2 and 3 to 1. Cyber Shield says it equips to a female-like card illustration. So, okay. You can use this for Harpy Lady or Mystical Elf, but what about a card like Blue Eyes? Is this white dragon a male or female? Can you assume Celtic Guardian's gender? I say probably not in this game. Dragon Piper says you can make an attack with a monster in the Dragon Capture Jar, much like the anime. But when you read Jar's effect, it states it straight up wins the battle, so you have to imply Piper's effect makes Jar equip the defeated monster for this effect to make sense. See how this is a spider web of ruling? Taya, a character card, is an important card to understand attacking. The rules are a bit confusing to figure out if you can attack with a monster that has already attacked, since you have to attack with a monster summoned from your hand. Taya's effect declares one monster that has already been used can attack instead, implying after a monster's attack, it has been used and therefore can't attack again unless by other means. It's like some sort of weird attack counter. This is fair, so you don't just attack with a strong monster every turn. This makes cards like Yami Yugi not as broken because otherwise he always wins in battles, and Gorgon who can attack three times consecutively, or Blue Eyes White Dragon's three body connection with Wicked Chain that can attack eight times. With Teya's ruling, these effects seem way less broken than at first glance. Speaking of Blue Eyes White Dragon's three body connection, this is a unique card. 
Similar to Exodia, you need multiple pieces to make up the one card. Four for the monster itself, and one for the spell for it to gain its effect to attack quadrillion times. Weird thing is, is that there exists a one card version making playing these multiple connections moot. There are also a set of sticker cards that exist from this era called Bandai Sealed Ass. Sealed Ass? I don't know how you pronounce it. However, I could not find anything that states these cards were ever used in play in any kind. There are only two cards here that garner my interest, and they are Exodia in a single body incarnation with a mere 1800 attack and a combination of dragons in Meteor Black Dragon, Boys White Dragon, and Red Eyes Black Dragon. That's one name. Which is as awesome as it is disappointing that they couldn't have thought of a better name like Red Eyes Meteor White Dragon. I once again have to reiterate how much research and problem solving I submerged myself in for this video. There is very little information or other videos about this topic, and more specifically the rulings and deck lists. I look at the card pool and the various themes you could go with. I built it in dueling books so the cards aren't as pretty looking as they could be, but hey, this took a ton of time for me to do. For the unique black magic and white magic attributes, I treated them as dark and light spellcasters respectively. So now let's look at some of the decks! Wait, 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 don't forget to subscribe if you haven't because that helps me upload more videos and know that you like content like this. A woman deck that uses Cyber Shield and Harpy Ladies for an equip beatdown. This is a Fiend slash Black Magic deck. You can use cards like Dark Energy or the other card that helps out Fiend types. Dragonic Pulse, that's that's what it's called. Haha, <laughs> on the spot. You could also go with a dinosaur slash dragon for a deck theme, that's kinda cool. Or character decks like Yugi. Joey. Even Kaiba. And this is a beatdown deck that uses the strongest monsters, but this is a double-edged sword because they all have high star ratings, which makes it easy to lose as well. And then this is a balance deck which combines both high-level creatures and low-level monsters with varying attack and defense. This one would be my go-to. And of course, here's my previously mentioned Exodia deck with a small deck size and nothing but stall and draw cards like Swords of Revealing Light and Yugi, which lets you add three cards from your hand because Pot Agree plus one is broken. Yeah, I hope you can see why Exodia should be banned in this format. This is also why playing a character card like Shoddy, which forces your opponent to play the next two cards from their hand at your choosing, to be mandatory. Monster Reborn also adds a card from the graveyard back to your hand, so, so Shoddy isn't an unstoppable counter if your opponent only has one Exodia piece at the time of activation. There are definitely plenty of splashable cards, whether it's a character card of your preference like Tristan, who's essentially just a free draw with no star rating, Kaiba, who wins against all monsters, or Miho that destroys high attack monsters. Catapult Turtle, when discarded, gains a monster a thousand attack, and the Gate Guardian pieces, which, when they're all on the field, act as a single Gate Guardian Spirit and is allowed to attack three times with a higher attack. These are just some cards to consider when deck building for the Bandai game. Of course, you also have a slew of magic cards that mostly increase attack and your two traps in Kunai with Chain and Mirror Force. So again, there are staples and better cards than others, but the Bandai game is about balance and you can still have fun with themed decks. So to go over the rules once more, make sure both players have the same size deck, draw 5 cards at the start, play 1 monster to initiate a battle, determine the result of both monsters by attack versus defense, if your attack is higher, the other monster is destroyed and you draw 1 card, if their defense is higher, both monsters are destroyed. Keep playing until both decks are empty and, at the end, count the star levels of your destroyed monsters. Those with the highest amount of levels for monsters they destroyed, wins. You can activate a back row card at any point, you have to play an attack with a new monster if you have one, and if not, then you still can't attack with one already on the field, and when one player's deck is empty, you still play until both are empty. I don't know what happens when two monsters attack with the same attack and defense, that I have no clue. 
I've talked with people online about the Bandai game, and some are even keen to adjust the rules for a modern, fair, and understandable setting. I also think that the rules here are so vague and simple that it can be hard to get into, much like how modern Yu-Gi-Oh! requires a master's degree in linguistics. However, as I mentioned earlier, you have to look at all the cards to understand the game as a whole, and once that's done, it's game on. I understand why this game failed and all the leaps and bounds Konami took to create a new game with way more transparent rules. It's a fascinating look at the earliest form of one children's card game, and comprehending how everything works was a fun challenge, if not making me a little more psychotic at the same time. Certainly, I would not mind seeing some more people get into this game, if not at the very least to have a better understanding of rules, rulings, deck variety, and some form of metagame, because, again, there's little to nothing to look at in terms of this game in 1998. It's as ancient as the Pharaoh's Tombs, as bizarre as Bizarro, and as confusing as Pendulum Summoning, and it's 100% Bandai. So let me know what you think. Does this game seem interesting to you? What card arts do you like? Let me know in the comments, or on Twitter, or on Discord, or pretty much wherever you can find me. And of course, until then, have a nice day.